Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 14th edition of Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government, hosted by the Institute for Government. I'm Gavin Freegard, Programme Director for Data and Digital at the IFG, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you this evening, especially given all the other social options you had tonight. But really, thanks for pulling yourselves away from CNN for an hour or so, and particular thanks for joining us given the last minute change of date. Sorry to have kept you waiting for an extra day, like we were some sort of returning officer in Pennsylvania. Now, while I share my screen, uh, let's begin in the traditional fashion. Hands up if you've been to Databytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your, your first Databytes. Welcome. It should be a memorable one for remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and scatter plot. Literally minutes of hard work went into trying to make those data points look like fireworks and failing miserably. We have a fantastic data driven display of presentation pyrotechnics for you this Guy Fawkes night. I know each and every one of our four presenters is going to rock it. But before I light the blue touch paper on those presentations and retire to a safe distance, some housekeeping. As ever, we're on the record and are being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to join in on Twitter, we're live tweeting from at IFG events and you can use hashtag IFG Databytes. And if you'd like to ask our presenters a question, you can do so by using the Q&A function you should be able to see here on Microsoft Teams. Should be a little icon with two speech bubbles, one of them with a question mark, or by using the hashtag on Twitter. So why are we here? A very existential question. A less existential answer, Data means lots of different things, and we want to bring the different communities working on those different things in and around government together. We want to show people what better data could actually mean in practice for them. And we want to provide a platform and a record of some of the most interesting things going on. That's the why, now for the how. You're about to see four different presentations about interesting data projects in government. Each of our presenters will have eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. There are eight bits in a byte, hence there are eight minutes in a data byte. And when I'm on screen, you'll be able to see the timer behind me. And whatever the current US president says, we will keep counting. Once the speaker has finished presenting, they'll face eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes of questions. Please do submit them throughout using the Q&A tool for me to put to our speakers. And then after that, we'll move on to the next speaker. So four eight minute presentations, each followed by eight minutes of questions. This is our 14th Databytes event. You can watch the previous 13, lucky for you, on the IFG website. You can see on screen Talia, Phil, Oscar and Gaia from last time out. Gaia talked about the national data strategy. A reminder, you've got until the 2nd of December if you want to submit something to the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and their consultation on that. So a lot has happened in global politics since we last met in September. And of course, this week has been a momentous one, culminating in Tuesday's historic event. Yes, that's when the Institute for Government launched our latest performance tracker report, our annual data informed view of how public services are performing this year's report focusing on the response to coronavirus. Next slide, please. Now, there's lots of interesting detail and analysis in the report. Don't worry, I'm not about to bombard you with all the charts and all the facts in a ridiculously short space of time. You can find the report and video of the launch on our website. Next slide, please. The IFG website is also where you'll find my critique of the government's presentation of data at Saturday's press conference. Unstructured chart theatre with too many charts in too short a time, charts that were confused and crowded, not created with all representation in mind, and suggesting that people inside government likely found it confusing rather than clarifying, just like the rest of us. So it's been a big week for data visualisation and indeed the world in general with the 2020 US election. Here's the famous New York Times needle showing who's likely to win various battleground states. There hasn't been this much excitement about needles since the latest COVID vaccine breakthrough. Now, despite having given an extra day for results to come in before data bites, I knew there was a chance the result would still be inconclusive or knowing my luck will become clear as I'm speaking. So let's start with some historical charts. This is showing you the result of every electoral college used to elect the president since 1964. Each state in the District of Columbia translates their popular vote into the electoral votes they're allocated based on the size of the state. And there are 538 electoral votes in total, making 270 the winning line. So excluding this year's election, Joe Biden's Democrats have won six of the presidential elections since 1964. Donald Trump's Republicans have taken eight. That includes four out of the five blowout wins where a winning candidate received more than 400 votes. You can see it's been decades since one of those. 
But that Republican tally also includes two of the five wins in US electoral history, where the winning candidate won the Electoral College without having won the popular vote, Bush in 2000 and Trump in 2016. So how does all that compare to this time round? Well, as things stand, Joe Biden is just a few votes short of the magic 270. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. There's Biden, there's Trump. They're the opposite way around from all the charts you've just seen in what was a deliberate attempt to model bad presentation practice rather than a make mistake on my part. I found more pictures of Trump with charts than I did Biden. Read into that what you will. Anyway, as things stand, uh, Biden has 253 electoral votes, according to most outlets, inching ever closer to the magic 270 and Trump has 214. You see we've named the three biggest states on each side as well. Now, Biden's total includes a few states he's flipped from 2016. There's one vote from Nebraska. He's taken a Milwaukee on the wild side in winning Wisconsin. And you can also see that he's won Michigan, lancing the boil of 2016 and recovering those 16 electoral votes from the Detroitus of four years ago. Now, some outlets are calling Arizona for Biden as well. That would take him to 264, though others are saying Trump could yet rise like a phoenix in Arizona and still take the state. So if we include Arizona, Biden is just six votes short and it would leave him needing one, just one of the five states still in grey. Not Alaska, since that's highly likely to remain Republican, but either Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania or Georgia to take him over the line. And he's either leading or very close behind in all those states. If Arizona stays red, Pennsylvania would be enough, as would any two of the other states. Now, this slide shows what would happen if Georgia went for Biden, because when I was finalising this presentation, there was a chance they might report at 5 p.m. And Trump's lead has been falling there throughout the afternoon. I'm sure like most of you, I've had Georgia on my mind the whole day through. All of that puts Biden and Kamala Harris, who'd be the first woman elected either president or vice president in US history, in pole position. But until all the votes are counted, it could still go either way. We'll just have to get used to Biden our time a little longer. Now, it's nice to focus on politics in a different country for a change, but it wouldn't be data bytes without our famous ministerial resignation chart. Yes, just a week after September's event, Lord Keane became the eighth minister to quit outside a reshuffle under Boris Johnson in under a year and a half. Now, here's a different version of the chart showing only cabinet resignations. And here's a version that shows Donald Trump's cabinet departures as well, ahead even of Theresa May. Let's see if he'll be the next to leave. Now, turning to tonight, and I say this every month, but I mean it every month, and especially tonight, we have a brilliant selection of speakers for you. First up is Rosalie Marshall, technical lead for the new Government Data Standards Authority, who will be talking to us about their work on standards assurance and accountability. After that, we'll hear from Michael Bertwistle, AI Barometer Lead at the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. Michael is the first person to present twice at Databytes. Back in July 2019, he introduced us to the project. Tonight, he'll be telling us about the finished report. We'll then hear from Lisa Steidel, data strategy lead at the London Borough of Hackney. She'll be talking to us about how the, the value of master data in helping Hackney respond to the pandemic. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from David Reed, senior technical architect in the Ministry of Justice, who'll be telling us about data infrastructure and the MOJ's analytical platform. We'll hopefully be back on Wednesday, the 2nd of December for the final data bites of 2020. What a year it's been. But we are dependent on sponsors to keep the series going. If you might be interested in supporting an event, please get in touch with my colleague Ritesh. You can see his details on the screen now. We've already got some brilliant speakers lined up for the next couple of events, but we are looking for people to present throughout 2021. So please do get in touch with me if you're interested or know someone else you might be. And finally, we'll be having some virtual drinks. Is there any other kind after tonight's event? Joining details are on screen. They're case sensitive. Uh, the link is bit.ly slash DB14 drinks. Password is IFG DB14. And we'll put that up at the end of the event too. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and we'll be able to go first to Rosalie. Good evening, Rosalie, how are you doing? Hi, Gavin. Uh, yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm very good and uh, very much looking forward uh, to hearing more about the Data Standards Authority. So over to you whenever you're ready. OK, so uh, thanks and, and thanks for, for having me here. Um, so can everyone everyone see the, the, the slides? Good. We can indeed. Okay. So I'm here today to present on the subject of the new authority and on the topic of data standards. I'm the technical lead for the Data Standards Authority, which sits within the Government Data Digital Service. So 
I'll begin by talking, uh, like Gavin uh, said in his, his opening, why are we here? Uh, why is the DSA here? Uh, who are we? What are we trying to achieve? And how to get involved? So, why are we here? This one might be an obvious one for most of you. There's a frustration across government that data can't be easily shared between departments. This tends to follow the issues that come with actually finding the right data. So we're building these data silos and we all know this does not support us in creating digital service that are that are efficient for users. The agreement for the DSA, the Data Standards Authority, was the need for an authority to tackle the foundational issues around data with a focus on operational data rather than statistics. Let's ensure that if we need to share data in specific circumstances, that we can technically share. And let us fix data flow in a way that will be successful. Rather than inventing a new data infrastructure, let us use the data standards that we already have as the cornerstone. So it's about working with standards that are already here, mainly those that are open and international. Sorry, I should say in, in most cases, in lots of cases already here, that's not to rule out new ones, and having these adopted by programmes as they shift designs or build something new. This means the core part of our role is having different programmes or departments agree on these standards as success is everyone using the same standard to in achieve interoperability. A large part of our role is about engaging in consulting and we have a growing number of consulting architects within our team to help us do that. The DSA's priorities. So as we consult and engage, we need to use user needs to inform our priorities. Obviously, there are a lot of problem areas, so we are prioritising according to a number of criteria, such as the COVID response and the level of impact we can make. One of the top priorities that we were aware of as we set up the DSA included recognising the value metadata standards can bring, and more on that in a minute. Meanwhile, we've been looking at specific data standards in specific contexts that can make an impact. And I give you examples of some data standards that we are coming across and how they relate to particular user needs. So one example is the legal entity identifier, and that could possibly help speed up access to bank loans for small businesses, uh, which are in need at the moment through helping create a smoother process. There's also the open community open referral standard, which could potentially really help vulnerable people right now by helping integrate social and health health care providers. So that's a, that's a brief overview, but who are we? So we've been around since April. Uh, um, we have a steering board and a peer review group that is helping govern our activities. We're a team of about uh, 16 people. We are also working closely with all government data communities and more on that later. And while we do this work, GDS is working in close partnership with ONS. And so to cement this relationship, we are also putting a number of the roles that we recruit from uh, into the DSA and they'll be based at the Office of National S Statistics. And most importantly, what are we doing? So there's a lot in scope. And you've probably got that impression from, from what I've been talking about already. And I've been mentioning specific data standards, but I wanted to explain that one exercise at the beginning was scoping the categories of data standards we can look at. And we are continuing to scope this out. These bullet points, I won't read them all out, are just a selection of the categories that we've scoped. We've scoped 16 categories at, um, uh, at the outset. And we're doing work in all of these bullets that I've, I've got up on the screen. I won't go into details now, but you can reach out to me if you want if you want more information. So one piece of work that I will mention is, is something that I mentioned earlier, and that's the work that we've done around metadata. One of the first priorities was around data quality for the DSA. We need better quality data so we can use data that we find, but also 
to help us find it in the first place and I'll come to findability in a second. So we've worked with a cross-government working group and the ONS Data Quality Hub to introduce some entry-level standards to metadata to improve data quality. And these standards focus on data shared privately between departments, as well as open data published on public sector websites. They also include uh, some best practice for, for CSV files. And these meta sta metadata standards are all on gov.uk with related guidance, so please take a look at that. And moving quickly on from the standards themselves to some of the other work streams, uh, one of the tasks in the DSA, DSA remit is to create an assessment assurance process for data. And we're doing this by reforming the controls that we already have at the centre. As many of you know, GDS checks department spend on technology or services and services, I should say, ensuring that we are making the right supplier and purchasing decisions. But spend controls don't look into data in as much detail as we'd like at the moment. So we are improving this with updated standards and more guidance to departments. So keep a lookout for that. Next, uh, we'll be looking at the service standard in more detail to make sure we are recommending all the right data practices as part of the assessment process. Final piece of work that I'll talk to you about is the API catalogue. So I've mentioned findability a couple of times in this presentation, but I wanted to mention a work stream that we're doing that touches on this. Hopefully some of you will be familiar with this page that I have up on slides. It's the front page of our API catalogue. And just in case it needs explaining, an API allows one system to connect to another so data can be exchanged. The idea behind the catalogue is to capture where these connections happen in government and to better get an idea of the standards used in these connections. Very importantly, the idea of the catalogue is also to help improve findability of the actual data source as well, because we all know that that's a problem. So on the API catalogue, we have 179 APIs now, 21 departments, and we have it on an api.gov.uk domain. That's all been since, uh, a lot of that has been since uh, the, the Data Standards Authority got up and running. And if you're working in government, please do visit api.gov.uk today, especially if you're working on an API. So final, final point is how to get involved. And I wanted to finish on something that is close to my heart, and that is of technical and data communities. At GDS, we've been running the API and data exchange community for a number of years, and that community has had some powerful conversations and done some very cool things in my view, such as the API standards, the catalog, just wanted to plug that this community is there for all those in government to sign up to if they wish and to let you know that we are expanding our community focus. As many of you know, there are many different data communities within government, including the government data architect com community within ONS, which we're working with very closely, but others also. And we're hoping to align these communities with a new community lead role. This new lead will be starting soon, sitting with ONS. So that's a way you can get involved in all of our work through, through the communities um, and a way that we, we can listen to, to a lot more of what goes on across government. I think I've finished my eight minutes. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Rosalie. Um, while Rosalie closes her presentation down, just a reminder uh, that you can put your questions to Rosalie via me uh, using the Q&A tool here on Teams. So you should be able to see on the, the sort of uh, little taskbar somewhere, uh, two little speech bubbles, one of them has a question mark in it. Please do uh, put your questions in there and I'll put them to Rosalie. So hopefully um, some will start coming through soon. In the meantime, um, you'll note that we've got uh, eight minutes ready for questions. So um, I will start with the first question, Rosalie. Um, it's really good to hear more about the sort of cross-government data community um, sort of work that you're you're sort of conducting. Um, one of the sort of long-standing issues in sort of government data is 
the proliferation of lots of different organizations and you know, different um, bodies, different functions, different professions, what else are you sort of doing to make sure that you're all working together as, as closely as you can? Yeah, I think I think this is one of the biggest challenges. It's the, you know, it's the level of engagement. And I mean, it's brilliant that that so many people have been interested in our work and have actually reached out to us, um, you know, and have made that that move. But, you know, we're also trying to make sure that we're covering off uh, you know, all the different types of organizations. So, you know, that there's there's academia, there's um, there's the Open Data Institute, there's there's so many organisations, as well as obviously lots of different central government departments, lots of local government departments, international. Um, so there's there's a lot of engagement needed, but we also need to make sure that you know our focus remains on on the work streams and actually delivering. Um, as I say, you know, our core priorities on 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 the user needs that we're identifying. Excellent, thank you. And um, we've got some brilliant questions already coming in. So I'm going to start with a related one. Uh, this is from Juliet Whitworth, the Local Government Association. Are you planning to work with local government? Uh, local government's done a lot of work in this area, including having a set of managed local government information standards and uh, work on a UK version of open referral to the DCMS last year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, um, actually, yeah, I, I, I was being really tight on, on time with my presentation, so I would have gone into more detail about the open referral point that I made. But but yes, we I, that's that's one data standard um, that that we ha have been looking at, but that actually we were approached um, on by by local government, um, by Worthing Council. Um, uh, to, to look at in more detail um, and separately been having conversations with um, different local councils, with uh, the LGA, um, with the data standards body, um, I Stand UK. So yeah, we're very keen to work in local government. And also I should mention that, um, you know, Paul Maltby uh, from MHCLG sits on our steering board as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we've got a question from Sam Smith now. Uh, he notes that you covered data sharing agreements and memorandums of understanding, um, which under the codes of practice of the Digital Economy Act, departments are supposed to publish um, their agreements on gov.uk. So this is all about uh, sharing of data within government. Um, but the Government Digital Service says it can't link to them from gov.uk registers. So his question is, will the Data Standards Authority require all new MOUs and agreements within your remit to be published and listed on gov.uk? Oh, I don't know if I can, if I can really answer that one yet. Um, we have a we do have a work stream that has kicked off on MOUs and data sharing agreements and to look at standards in that area. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's it's still kind of early days, so I don't know if that's uh, on the agenda. But if it is an issue, then I, I'm sure we're kind of coming across it. Um, Sam, it's you know we've been in touch uh, in touch by by email. So if you want to to shoot that uh, question to me directly, I can uh, I can tra transfer it over to our MOU team. Fantastic, thanks, Rosalie. Um, Selena has a question which been, which has been coming up quite a lot at recent data bites. Actually, um, she says if everything is connected, can you track the impact on the money that's been spent? I suppose, are you able to work work out um, what what effect your spending is having, for instance? So uh, that's yeah, that's that's a very interesting, um, a very interesting question. And one role that we are very keen to have as part of the Data Standards Authority is and, and actually we, we've already kind of entered conversations uh, around this is is to have an economist to to really look at this detail because we've realised that projects in government that do have an economist as part of their team and can label, can give information on the, the financial impact that they are having, um, just, just are a lot more powerful um, in, you know, in kind of in making their arguments um, and in their approach. So it's something that we're definitely looking at. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in, so we're probably not going to get through all of them. Apologies in advance. Um, this is a question from Peter Wells, uh, who very much enjoyed the presentation. What examples do your team use to explain that sometimes it's unhelpful to implement a standard? 
That's an interesting one. I need to I need to have a think about that. Um, I mean, I think there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely instances on um, on where it's been, you know, on where maybe MOUs and data sharing agreements have been unhelpful. Um, I need to have a think about. Uh, we we haven't actually, you know, no one's asked me that yet. Um, and uh, we're obviously looking at opportunities for data standards as we consult and engage. So um, this one hasn't, uh, I don't think it's come up, but I don't want to say that because there might have been occasions where, uh, you know, things have, I'm, I'm just trying to pick my brains, but, but occasions where projects haven't gone along the right path because the wrong data standard was implemented. But I'll need to have a think about that one and ask the team and get back to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question is from David Dinsdale at SAP. How can suppliers to government better align with data standards, for example, in preparing the systems they operate for a better data future? Yes, so I think this is a really interesting one. And there's something like the, the API community, for example, um, in recent events, we've been getting suppliers involved because we understand that it's really important that you know that suppliers are, are helping us uh, consider these standards um, uh, as well as being asked to abide to them. We are doing uh, some uh, some amount of engagement with suppliers on different areas, different work streams. Um, one way that they can keep updated is we. We've just got a content team in place that are looking at our content strategy, and they are looking at how we will how we will promote all of the data standards that are being recommended across government. And so at least soon, we hope there will be a, a page or somewhere where you can go where you can actually see the data standards that we are recommending. Um, the content team are, are working that out now, but we do realise that there is a lot, you know, clearer labelling is needed um, on areas of data standards. I think also, you know, the spend controls process, um, the reforms that we're making to that have involved us updating the technology code of practice, uh, which I, I believe is, is looked at by, by suppliers as well. And some of the standards um, are now referenced there that hadn't been before. Fantastic, thanks. And too many good questions to get through. I'm going to, I'm going to squeeze one final one in. This is from Aoife. Um, are there any thoughts on how data in service assessments will be incorporated? Um, for people who don't know, um, any sort of digital services going online on gov.uk are required to go through a service assessment. So how, how will your work and sort of data relate to that? Yes, so this is a good one. And as I said, you know, we're looking at the controls processes we have. So Spain Controls was the first process that we looked at updating to take account of data and data standards and data best practice. The second one will be service assessments, but we haven't really got too far on that journey yet. But one thing that we are thinking about is a separate API assessment process that might be voluntary. Um, and we're still working this out with the API community, but it would sit alongside the service assessment process, but look at details of APIs. Um, but but we will engage um, at that point uh, with uh, the cross-government community. So we'll be looking for, for views on, on the updates that need to happen to that to take account of, of data. Fantastic. Well, Rosalie, that's been a really helpful introduction to the Data Standards Authority. Uh, good luck with what's, what's a huge amount of work. And uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so next, we'll be welcoming back uh, for the first time a uh, speaker coming for their second round of Data Bytes. Uh, Michael, good evening. How are you? Hi, Gavin. I'm well. How are you doing? I'm very, very still, good. Still you. fine. I'm still fine. <laughs> uh, Although try, just... trying to battle the fireworks that are going off outside. But, yes, uh, me too. <laughs> but um, I'll leave it over to you. Great. Thank you, Gavin, for, for having us back. And as you say, this is in fact a, a sequel presentation. Um, so uh, having been here to present the very early stages of our work, it's really exciting to be able to come back and show the fruits of our labour. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with us at the, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, we were set up by government in 2018 with a fairly unique remit to help maximise the benefits of AI and data use 
for society and the economy. And this summer we published our first AI barometer report, which was our sort of first major cross sector publication. And I'm going to be taking you on a very quick tour of it, looking at its findings around opportunities and risks presented by AI and data use our approach to the research and then some reflections on uh, the, the research process as a whole. So the idea at the centre of the barometer is very similar to that of the CDI itself, asking the question, how uh, can we maximise the benefits and minimise the harms of using AI and data? And the barometer approaches this by asking what we can learn by looking across the landscape and understanding how opportunities, risks and governance issues manifest across different contexts and what that tells us about what we need to address in order to get those benefits. And it might seem like an obvious point, but data driven tech uh, presents radically different opportunities and risks depending on the context in which they're deployed. So we chose to look at five sectors in this first edition of the barometer and we chose them to try and get a good spread of um, how personal data is used by services and systems, the level of digital maturity and the current level of AI and data analytics use in those sectors, how services are delivered and commissioned, so publicly or privately or a mix, and, and what the existing governance systems and approaches look like. And the report's findings were informed by the tech and sector communities, which I'll come back to later. So the, the central message in the report is really that AI and data use have some incredibly promising applications in addressing some of the biggest challenges facing our society, be that climate change, the health and care needs of an aging population or addressing inequality, but not all benefits are equal. Uh, many of them represent greater or lesser potential benefits and will be easier or harder to achieve. And there's this class of high benefit, hard to achieve opportunities that contain some of the most game changing applications, be that realising decarbonisation quicker, identifying and tracking public health risks at speed or using automated decision support systems in contexts like health or criminal justice in a way that actually reduces bias. But these are, as I say, harder to achieve opportunities and they often share key characteristics such as the use of complex data flows about individuals, where they affect decisions that have a direct impact on individuals or their rights, and where they require coordination across organisations or complex ecosystems. And this means that we're unlikely to achieve the most promising benefits of this technology without overcoming significant common barriers around the governance systems that we use to regulate the technology and practices around its use, low data quality and availability, issues around our workforce and skills, market barriers such as data monopolies or data concentration, a lack of knowledge around the real impact of using many of these technologies, and ultimately the need to ensure that these systems are trustworthy and have the confidence of users and the public. And those with a keen eye will notice that there's a lot of overlap here with the issues identified in the uh, pillars of the recently published national data strategy. And in the report, we touched in particular on the need for public trust and on the governance barriers we found as regulation is one of those few levers that policymakers have direct control over. So while this may not feel like a particularly novel conclusion, what the barometer does is pull together the story and the evidence of how this is occurring, both within and across sectors in a lot of detail. So concretely, if you read it, you're gonna find a closer look at the barriers we identified, key use cases of AI and data by sector categorized by how difficult they're likely to be to achieve, a breakdown of the risks associated with AI and data use commonly occurring across sectors, and some observations on how responses to the impact of COVID-19 have affected technological trends and how that might be changing the picture. And what we've tried to add to the debate here is a feeling of relative urgency. So to take this sort of um, traffic light table in the top right of this uh, slide, um, uh, which lists sort of common risks across different sectors. None of those risks identified here will probably come as any great surprise to anyone familiar with the debates around AI and data use, but it does help give a sense which of these are the most pressing for us to address both within and across sectors and which represent some of the greatest barriers to realising those benefits that I talked about earlier. Um, I'd just like to set these findings in a little bit of context. I'm going to talk about what's behind the barometer's findings and how we came to them. So I said earlier that the barometer is a community informed view. Uh, understanding the impacts of AI and data use is a necessarily interdisciplinary endeavour. And it was really important to us that we involved uh, the people and the organisations developing, deploying and being subject to the technology. So we put together expert panels from across industry, academia, civil society and government with a diverse set of expertise and perspectives. And we consulted them at several stages to build and refine our findings. 
And the other thing I'd like to touch on, uh, which is a little different to the approaches we've seen in this space, is the way that we tried to make sense of the landscape. So particularly when we were looking at risks presented by uh, risks uh, presented by AI and data use, we found that we quickly be it became challenging to filter them and work out what needed focusing on. And this was one of the places that we brought in our panels. So we used a series of surveys to ask panelists which risks they thought were most likely and which were most impactful using a process of pairwise comparison in each instance, presenting them with a pair of options and asking them to pick one. So you can see an example of this on the right of this slide. And the survey platform we chose gave us relative scores that sort of aggregated the panel's perceptions for each risk against likelihood and against impact, which we plotted, as you can see there in the middle. Uh, and these graphs are available in each of the sector chapters. And as well as giving us a sense of which risks were the most concerning, which individual risks, we laid a rough thematic typology on top of these risks that helped us pick out broader themes like the prominence of privacy and discrimination issues in the criminal justice sector, as we can see here. And what that let us do in the workshops we subsequently ran was really focus discussion around a few key issues and explore them in depth. So most of what I've talked about so far is really what you'll find at the beginning and the end of the report. That is the summary of findings and the methodology. The bulk of the report is made up of five sector chapters that dive into a lot more detail and I'm not going to cover them here. But in particular, I'd, I'd like to highlight the, the sort of the pullouts that um, uh, that highlight some of the great examples of innovative governance approaches and the latest work going on in these sectors, including uh, recent developments around the pandemic, as well as more developed studies of the major risk themes. So having covered what's in the report, um, I thought I'd just share some reflections on what it's like been like to try and research a, uh, a very large area. You can see a slide here on the right from my original data by setting out the problem space. Um, there were some research challenges comparing opportunities like this and risks like this is inherently difficult. You have a very large number of things to compare. They're often articulated at different levels of abstraction, you know, from individual group, corporate or societal levels and with different trade offs. That's a lot of cognitive load for any one expert that you're trying to get their feedback on to to give you views. Um, and we found we think we think we found a good solution with that sort of pairwise approach, at least in narrowing the field for in person discussion. Um, we found that co-creation really improved the quality of the research. We've got our panels to help us articulate and draft the statements that we ran surveys on. Um, uh, and that's something that we want to build on in future. And lastly, just to note that sort of the literature does seem to understate the human benefits of AI. So, for example, using image recognition software to reduce the exposure of policing staff to traumatic con content is a really valuable benefit, but not really the sort of economic or organizational benefits that AI is usually associated with. So I think I've used up my eight minutes, so I'm just going to briefly say that this is obviously uh, influencing the CDI's work program at the moment, how we conceptualize the landscape and we're talking to colleagues across government about how this work can support theirs and um, we've got a lot of ambitions about new sectors, um, improving our methodology and exploring new ways to uh, present this information that isn't just a sort of PDF. So I'm going to stop there, really happy to take questions uh, and please do get in touch if you'd like to talk to us about your work. Brilliant, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just to remind everybody, you can put your questions to Michael by using the Q&A tool on Teams. That's the two little speech marks with a question mark in there. Um, let's see if we've got any questions and I'll get ready on the timer. Um, so let's start with a question from Anonymous. Um, this summer had That's an example. Fine. <laughs> it seems to be very popular at Databytes events, ask loads of questions. Um, so Anonymous um, asks, this summer had an example of mutant algorithms, quote unquote, uh, around A-levels. If your report had come out after the A-level fiasco, what would CDEI have changed in the report? Um, so uh, it's a good question. I mean, we didn't cover education in this particular report. Um, uh, so in terms of the immediate findings, I don't think um it would have necessarily i mean it's, it's it's very important context but it wouldn't necessarily influence the report it is something that we're interested in looking at in future iterations um but what i would point out is um if you look on sort of page i think it's 13 of the report that uh that traffic light diagram of the um the, the sort of the common risks that you find across all sectors um let's see if i can just share share that so that I can uh, there we go so this sort of thing you can see um, sort of many of the issues that were raised by that particular example are, are were very much reflected in the existing sectors as some of the sort of the top common risks so the idea of algorithmic bias the idea of 
um, uh, the sort of the necessity of algorithms being um, explainable, um, a sort of very uh, and, and, and the capacity for sort of loss of trust in institutions when those things go wrong, uh, very much on the top of the minds of our um, of our expert panelists. And so I think it uh, in that sense would have very much reinforced those findings. Excellent, thanks. Um, a really good question from Selena, which was uh, along the lines of something I was going to ask as well, actually. Um, she's asking when you're talking about the expert panels, are those panelists people who've worked in the grassroots organisation and are they there for the knowledge or are they all high level professionals? And I suppose there's a sort of question about for all of the really important expert engagement, how are you speaking to the public about some of these issues as well? So uh, that's a uh, that's a really good question. Um, so we tried to go, uh, we tried to get both in terms of the types of organisations that were going, but also the types of expertise that we had in the room. We went for a deliberate uh, spread of diversity. So we made sure we didn't just sort of have policy people or um, I, I suppose data analysts or people that, that work with data. We really tried to get a spread of that and a, a spread of seniority as well. Um, it is definitely our ambition to scale that up in future, um, uh, partly through the surveys, and we need to look at creative ways also of involving people um, in sort of, uh, you know, more workshop type formats in the current environment as well. It is, it's, it's, it's a definitely a big research challenge, but um, uh, very much trying to get us, you know, very, very important for us, for example, to involve civil society in those discussions. Um, can you remind me, sorry, of the second part of that question? Um, so it was that they worked in grassroots and they're there for the knowledge of the high level professionals and then um, how you engage the public more widely. Right, yes. So um, so the other thing that the CDEI, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that's very important to us. It's something that, for example, in our, um, our targeting review that was published earlier this year, um, there were aspects of the sort of research on that that deliberately sort of um, brought in members of the public and under, like tried to understand how their attitudes changed. Um, to understanding uh, how their data was used and how comfortable with it they were with that, with varying levels of understanding about um, how their data was being used. Um, and we are also uh, sort of um, in the process of setting up something of a sort of public opinion observatory, so some sort of regular polling to understand um, sort of public attitudes around uh, around data use. Excellent. I think you're talking yourself into a third data bytes presentation already. Um, Might have to be one of my colleagues that, that is more <laughs> knowledgeable on this. So just a reminder, people, you can uh, put your questions to Michael using the Q and A tool. We've had some great questions so far, and here's another one from Craig Morris, uh, who thought that was great. Um, the focus of your presentation seemed to be AI by statistical linkage and processing of connection, even if multidimensional. Are you going to go further and use real learning decision developing AI? So I suppose a question about the different types of artificial intelligence there. Um, so we went deliberately broad on this and it's it's um, a sort of we don't we, we didn't use a sort of particularly um, narrow definition of uh, AI. We tried to look at um, any data driven technology where insights are derived from data and then sort of lead to decisions or actions and so on. Um, whether that's, you know, reasonably simplistic data analytics or whether that's sort of advanced machine or deep learning and so on. Um, uh, because ultimately what we're interested in is the sort of the impact of, data, of of that data use and how you generate those benefits and mitigate those risks. So um, uh, we do have a sort of a, a technical team at the CDEI that are, are very much sort of, um, you know, data scientists and people that have worked in the technology space um, who I suppose think quite hard about um, uh exactly the sorts of technologies that we should be engaging with and also um you know ha yeah just just how how we're going to engage with different forms of technology but for the ai barometer it, it really felt important for us to just go as broad as possible um and in some sectors you found that those use cases those technologies were were fairly narrow so in criminal justice there were sort of three or four main use cases that we identified whereas in um, health and social care it really you do have an incredible breadth of the the types of technologies that are being deployed 
Excellent, thanks. So we've got just under two and a half minutes. I'm going to try to squeeze in questions from Hartley Miller and from Tim Smith. Uh, so first to Hartley's question, you mentioned impact in that last answer actually. How will you deal with wider societal impacts, both those that verge on what's politically desirable and at least as important, says Hartley, those that require modelling of interactions within society? So in the first instance, um, it's just about making sure that they're in scope and um, you know we deliberately again draw the net quite wide when we're so so very specifically what we do when we're when we're conducting the air barometer research is we craft risk statements that represent sort of in a in a sentence or two um what that risk is and um we work with our panelists to sort of craft and, and tune those so that they correctly reflect the um the way that that risk arises um uh and so the uh, so so the first thing is to sort of get it on the table, and the second thing is if it if it sort of pops out of our uh, uh, sort of analysis and surveys as, as an important risk, it's just something that it's about discussing it in detail. Um, we haven't got into the sort of the business of measuring those, um, but it's you know the the and the centre is there ultimately to ask the question sort of how do we use this technology responsibly how do we maximize the benefits from it and implicitly I, I guess the core message of the barometer is you do need that public trust in order to maximize those benefits and if you don't have it then um, you're going to massively limit the impact that that technology can have um, so I, I feel like that could you could you could do a whole 80 minutes on, on on that particular discussion you had some other questions but um very good question yeah so one final question i'll last of half a minute a perfect one on on which to end tim smith at white hat asks are there recommendations from the report you draw out in particular on how we can empower consumers and citizens so i think you you, you would be better off looking at some of our other publications such as our snapshot reports or our targeting review that was out or our forthcoming um algorithmic bias review if you're looking for concrete recommendations um the barometer deliberately wasn't the sort of a vehicle for rec sort of specific recommendations it's more uh, it's more about sort of pushing that central narrative about making sure that um we move forward with technology in a way that is sort of um trustworthy and trusted by the public and therefore is able to sort of um realize its potential Brilliant, Michael. Well, um, there's lots to unpack there and uh, lots of reading for us to do on the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation website as well. So thank you very much indeed and no doubt see you again at some point at Data Bytes. Thanks very much, Gavin. Cheers. Excellent. So um, I'm sat here in Haringey uh, this evening, um, but I'm going to throw over to a different part of London and we're going over to Hackney where we're joined by Lisa. So uh, Lisa, good evening. How are you? Hi, Gavin. Thanks for having me. I'm well. How are you? I'm I'm very well, thank you. I'm having a very good evening so far um, and very much looking forward to hearing more about the value of master data in the pandemic. So over to you. Great. OK, so I'm Lisa Steidel. I'm the data strategy lead at Hackney Council um, here to talk about the value of master data during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just want to start off with a bit of background. Firstly, I want to define what I mean by master data because there are a few different definitions out there, but what I mean by master data is core reusable trusted data, identifiers that we can use across different applications and the spine that joins data together. And I'll give some more illustrative examples shortly. Why do we need master data? Um, Hackney Council, like most local authorities, holds information about our residents, properties and activities in many different IT systems because of the, the range of services that we deliver. And these systems often don't talk to one another. So we've had to invest quite a lot in our master data management uh, to enable us to break down those service silos and join up our data across applications. In our team, we have two core data products that help us do that. One is the local land and property gazetteer called the LLPG for short, and our citizen index. So first the LLPG, which enables us to join data at a property level. The LLPG is a master database for all addresses and properties in our borough. And it's the source of the unique property reference number, also known as the UPRN, which local authorities absolutely love to talk 
talk about. Um, and it does what it says on the tin. It is a unique identifier for each property in the borough and it can serve as a key that joins data across different applications. And we've integrated our LLPG into over 25 systems at Hackney. So moving on to our citizen index, this enables us to do person level joins with our data. It aims to give us a single view of our residents. It serves as a central place for key contact information and a spine which enables us to join different data together. It brings together data from nine council services like housing, social care, council tax and parking. And it's got multiple uses across the organisation. So we can use it to join up back office systems, resident verifications, searching for information about a person or a property and data, ana data analysis when there's a legal basis for doing so. Just to illustrate what this looks like, this is a bit of dummy data um, from four basic services within the council. We've got council tax, housing, social care and the electoral register. And for this same resident, you can see that we've got varying data about this person within each of these systems. So we have different ways of recording their name across these systems. We have variations of their address. Each system has a different unique reference number referring to this person that's specific to that system. We have different contact details and in some cases none um, and also a date of birth. We have data quality issues there. So two of the dates of birth for this person are the same and one has been transposed just because of a recording error when it was entered into the system. So we use citizen index to do rules based and deterministic matching to develop a, a single view of this customer. So here for this resident, we have a more authoritative uh, version of the name, address. We have all of those reference numbers for all of the systems together. So that is really what I mean by the spine that we can then join the data together. Um, we have more contact details for that person than we would have if we looked in just one of these systems and we have cleaner data. So how have we been using master data in the context of COVID-19? As lockdown measures began in March, a need was quickly emerging. The council really needed to understand the potential impact on our residents and our services were really eager to support their vulnerable residents, but not clear on how or who they needed to reach out to. And as a team, we were really well positioned to help. So we sit as a corporate data and insight team within ICT. So we have access to our administrative data, but we also sit next to our information governance colleagues. We've invested in our master data management over years and years. We've got a great mix of skills within our team from data engineering to data science and GIS. And we had a previous project that we could build upon which joined data together using UPRN to identify illegal HMOs, which are houses for multiple occupations. So really half of the work was done for us. Um, so we built a data model joining all these different data sets together using the UPRN. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but it gives you a flavor of the types of information that we were using in the model. Um, council tax, data on the food deliveries of our local provision, waste, housing information. And this helped us to build a comprehensive view of each property. Um, so each line in our data model um, is for a residential property identified by its UPRN and then we have many different indicators for that household. Uh, for example, whether they're known to adult social care, claiming housing benefit, if someone in the household is shielding. Um, and joining this wide range of data means we can break down those service silos and understand a lot more about our residents and their needs. And we use this for COVID-19 to identify potential vulnerabilities. And as a council, we really wanted to think quite broadly about what it meant to be vulnerable in this situation. We wanted to think about the direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19. So we were able to flag 14 potential vulnerabilities in our data set, which are listed here on the right. Uh, and they vary from living alone, living in temporary accommodation, being a lone parent uh, and being known to social care. But many of these indicators are identified use logic across council data sets. So joining up that data is really important. Um, for example, our indicator on whether someone has a disability or health condition looks at five 
different data sets. So we check um, shielding data, disability related benefits, council tax reductions, um, supported bulky waste collections and blue badge parking permits. And then we actually used all of that data to support our vulnerable residents. These indicators enabled us to identify and prioritize households to proactively contact to offer our support as a council. And we also used our citizen index to provide more comprehensive contact details for these households, which enabled our officers to reach more people. Um, so for example, our colleagues in housing uh, were only using the contact information they had in their own housing system and were only getting through to about 50% of people that they phoned. But when we gave them citizen index data, they were able to get through to 72%. And we've been also been using our citizen index data to help us get in touch with residents for local contact tracing where we haven't been provided with that information. So the impact of this work, um, it's helped services identify, prioritize and support the most vulnerable residents in Hackney, and it's ensured that we're effectively targeting our resources. It's enabled the council to make evidence based decisions, particularly around our local food provision during the first wave. It's provided us with a data model that we can continue, oh, sorry, we can continue to build on and reuse. And it's raised awareness and appreciation for master data. Even our mayor is now talking about UPRNs, which is quite exciting for our team because it's not normally a thing um, that people talk about very often. So I think I'm about out of time. Um, thank you so much. If you want to get in touch, my contact details are there. And if you also want to find out what else is going on in Hackney, um, the IT uh, services website is listed there. Lisa, that was great. Thank you. Fascinating and incredibly topical as well, which is reflected in some of the questions we're already getting. Um, just a reminder, if you are watching, you can put your questions via me to Lisa using the Q&A tool. So please do uh, get thinking and asking. And let's start uh, with another question from Anonymous, who's been very busy again this evening. <laughs> Has your approach to a citizen index been replicated elsewhere by other councils or local authorities? And they've also asked, does the master data system allow anonymization easily? Uh, yes, other councils do have similar um, master data systems. We, a lot of us do it in a slightly different way. There are different softwares that we use to do that matching process, um, but there are other councils, not all councils. And I think Hackney is probably one of the longest running citizen index products. We've had our citizen index around for about 10 years. So um, other councils that I know of have started on that journey just a year or two ago. Um, so we're really thinking about how we can refresh our technical architecture about um, that we use for the citizen index um, to use more modern methods. So we're really interested in how we uh, now bring that together with our API infrastructure. Um, sorry, what was the second question on that? So the second question was about anonymization and does the master data system allow you to do that easily? No, we don't currently use it for anonymization because mainly it is used to do verifications or to search for actually that person's details. Um, so we might think about doing anonymization if we really wanted to just use it for an analytical project, but um, mostly it's been used for operational purposes where we really do need the actual information. Great, thank you. Um, loads of questions flooding in. Um, so I'm going to take two related ones. Uh, Anonymous, again, really great presentation. They, mm -hmm. They're very grateful. Um, what's the technology stack you use for the Citizen Index? And from Mary Susan, did you develop your own architecture and software in-house or did Hackney buy off-the-shelf products? Um, so the, the core system that we use to do the matching is something called ClearCore. It's um, from a, a company called InfoShare, but we have a variety of different things that pull everything together. We use Microsoft BizTalk to help with some of the feeds into the Citizen Index. Um, but as I was saying, we're rethinking what that architecture looks like and how we might be able to do some of that outside of it. So we haven't built uh, much of that in-house, but we are thinking about how we bring that in-house and how we can stop using and depending on some of those systems. Excellent. Uh, a question from Anna next. Um, it says some really interesting work going on. Any tips on developing a data and analytics strategy for a local authority? What are the core principles you'd like to see in such a strategy? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, 
the core principles, I think, um, you know, the master data principles about of, of being able to join data is really important. Um, you know, that's not just part of our data strategy as an organization, but that's part of our ICT strategy. Um, it's really important that when we procure systems, we are sure that we can get the data out, we can use it, we can link it up with other things. And importantly, we can understand it because a lot of the legacy systems that we have, we've got systems with you know, 3000 tables in the database and no metadata, no documentation. So a lot of the times when you're trying to get something meaningful out of it, um, that's really difficult. So um, that's just one. I think there's there's quite a lot of things to consider a, as a whole local authority, but that's kind of um, the most important thing from my angle, but happy to pick that up in in more detail later. Great, thank you. Um, loads of brilliant questions. This one's from Selena. Um, can what you're doing be used to measure the impact of services that are commissioned as well as charities where services are outsourced? That's a really good question and something I was thinking about um, when that was asked earlier. I think one of the difficult things about working with local authority data is that we don't know what we don't know. And most of our data is based on people who use our services and tell us they have a need and that when they no longer need our services, they fall off of our data sets and we're not measuring those positive impacts. Um, we just know that they don't need our services anymore. I mean, which is a, a positive impact in of itself, um, but it is a, a little bit more difficult to, to measure. Um, but we have throughout this process really looked at how we implement our, well, what was our local food provision in the first lockdown um, and using that data to make sure that it was reaching the right people. Um, so we were really able to measure the impact of that service. Excellent. Um, we've got a question from Dan Klein. Is the spine data available to the citizen when accessing the original services? No, not as such. We, we do have something called um, one account, which is our, our interface for citizens to access some of their data. And some of it is, is available, but but all of their, you know, that spine of all of their reference numbers and everything is not. Um, I suppose if someone were to ask, you know, to make a subject access request or something that they would be able to access that, but it's not something that they can freely log in and see. Great, thank you. And um, I'm going to take some two questions together here because there's some re relation between them. So Simon Briscoe, evening Simon, asks how many people and what resource would a council need to make decent progress from a standing start in a year? And Tim Smith asks, um, says this is awesome, and asks how much human input is required to clean the data between silos and unify it in the master database? And um, he also asks, would the government's proposed plans for a single digital identity help save time? Hmm. OK, really, there's three questions there, so I'm going to try and remember what they are. Um, so the first, how much effort is required? And actually, the team behind, I don't know if they're talking about the citizen index or, or the, the suite of what we do. So as a team, as a data and insight team, I think there's about 12 of us. And in the master data team, really, there's one person looking after our LLPG. And I think that's quite common across local authorities. And we've got really one person who brings together the citizen index, um, although um, you know, there is involvement from other teams, but that is similar to the, the amount of effort that I've seen in other local authorities. It, it has been amazing what people can do with just one or two people. But I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues in another borough um, who does something very similar. And they were saying, really, if we want to get this right, we need five master data analysts. <laughs> um, so uh, I think you make you make do with what you have and we we've done a really, really good job uh, with the resources, but especially if we're going to change up our architecture and move away from out of the box solutions, we will probably need to invest a bit more in that. So sorry, that was the first question. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the first second. So the first question was sort of resource in general. The second question was human input into cleaning data. Human input. Um, I think especially towards the start, it takes quite a long time to get your rules um, right. So, you know, you can set thresholds based on how happy you are in the match with the matches. And it also depends on what your data looks like. You know, in Hackney, we've got we're we've got a very churny population that's changing all the time. Um, we also have quite a diverse population with a really diverse set of names. Um, 
So definitely towards the start, it took a lot of human intervention to audit those matches to make sure we were happy with them. But once we've we've optimized our rules base, um, it needs less and less as you go on. And the very final question was with the government's plans for a single digital ID, which they definitely need to outline in more mm. detail. Um, would those help uh, your work? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That would be brilliant. Um, and we and we tried we, we tried to do a, a similar thing within the local authority to create a local authority reference number. Um, and we stu do still kind of have it, but it, it is difficult, as I mentioned, with such a churn with messy data. Um, in all of our systems, people think if you bring nine messy data sets together, you can come out with one perfect one, and it's not quite that way sometimes. Um, so there have definitely been challenges. If we've got a unique ID for people, that would be brilliant. Lisa, that was absolutely fascinating. And sorry to those of you who asked really brilliant questions that I wasn't able to squeeze into the time. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And last but not least, um, our final speaker tonight is David Reed from the MOJ. Um, David, I'm absolutely fine, thank you. How are you doing this evening? Not very good. I was just enjoying Lisa's talk and think it follows very nicely into my one. It's great what you can do when you sort out your data. Perfect. Well, on, on that note, I shall hand over to you. So whenever you're ready. So there's an old adage to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I know this is true because my four year old boy got hold of a hammer recently and gleefully made a mess of his bedroom wall. And it's also true when working with data. If your data extends to thousands of records, you probably shouldn't be storing it in Excel. The spreadsheet hammer is the wrong tool for that job. Perhaps you need a database instead. But it's usually not the fault of the person holding that spreadsheet hammer. They probably know the data tools they really want, but the organisation has probably made them difficult to access. We need to make sure that analysts have access to the right tools for the job. I want to take you on the journey that we've been on at the Ministry of Justice to improve our data tools and data infrastructure and show you the real difference it makes. So I'm going to be talking tonight about analysts using data. So I'll just explain where they fit into the Ministry of Justice and compare with the other data users. So data originates in the Ministry of Justice in computer systems and you have people looking after those Simpsons systems uh, looking at the data of how they're performing, whether the users are making good use of them, etc. You have the people using those systems, people on the front line, inputting data, using the data they see on the screen to make decisions hour by hour. And then downstream of that system, you have the not quite as live data. It's used for management information reporting, and you can see how longer term trends are happening. Uh, and there'll be reports and there'll be graphs used by management and all sorts of people. And then the area I'm most interested in is the analysts and they're doing much more complex uh, data work. They're doing statistical releases. They're doing complex insights for management and policy use. So this is the area I'm going to be talking about. I've already talked about Excel being used badly. And I want to give some more examples of bad practices in data analysis that can happen if you don't have data infrastructure in place. I think in years gone by, many large organisations have been vulnerable to these sorts of problems. So firstly, data can be passed around to teams using email. Maybe corrections get done by one team and it's passed to the next one, and there's some uncertainty about what's happened to it. Uh, audit trail is, gets lost, the history isn't there. Analysts have a habit of storing their code on a network drive, and this is not very helpful. You might not remember which is the exact file you use to produce those results. There are some traditional statistical software packages around designed in the 70s for the corporate environment and they're not great. You might design your data transformation by drag and drop of standard blocks, so you might not know exactly how each block is implemented. These things are expensive to buy, expensive to train people in, and fewer and fewer people in the industry have skills in them. And so you've done your analysis and you do your outputs to show to st stakeholders and people who need those insights. So you might do a PDF or a, or a PowerPoint presentation, then it might as well be written into stone uh, because drilling into that data is really hard. The end user has to go back to the analysis analyst who produced it. And if you want an update to that data, it's got to go right back to the beginning of the cycle, extract some fresh data and all the manual processes that went through to creating that output. 
Of course, things are constantly improved over time. But a couple of years ago, we decided to invest in the Ministry of Justice and a new generation of data infrastructure, and we call it the analytical platform. It makes a leap onto two really big growing technologies. The first one is open source tools. I'm talking about R and Python, which are the leading languages for working with data. They have much better libraries than the previous generation of software. This huge ecosystem where everyone can contribute their natural language processing, machine learning, things like Spark for big data processing, and the boundaries are being pushed every week. And the new recruits we, we hire at the Ministry of Justice are already trained in it, and that's what they want to use. The second big technology is public cloud services like AWS or Azure. And these make it really easy to get things like relational databases or graph databases, uh, Spark, and it's all pay as you go, self-serviced, managed for you, really convenient. We're really excited about a particular service called Athena, which is a super easy way to run the SQL queries straight from a large CSV file. And scale is, is, is really exciting. So for example, recently we wanted to do some data linking between two large databases. It was quite intensive. We wanted to have all records in memory at once. And so spinning up 128 gigabyte RAM server for a few minutes to run it uh, was, was very convenient and only cost a few pence. And I've got a link at the bottom, which will be available afterwards for more about this approach. We built analytical platform by gluing together these two things, the open source tools and the public cloud giving the best of both worlds. And I'll just quickly take you through the parts of the platform. So we start off with a data lake, this central place to put data, and we get snapshots of nearly all Ministry of Justice databases into it. It's stored in the cloud and it gives quick and secure access to users. Data is then automatically transformed into versions which are clean, clean, usable, and joined up. And then these, this, these data sets are available in some development environments for R and Python, where they can access the data and they can also access a bunch of services and databases. So these are from the cloud services, but also any open source packages which we run in containers. So they do the analysis and maybe the output is a traditional PDF, but more excitingly, they can automatically deploy an interactive uh, Shiny app, which is a, is a visualization and then expose that to end users throughout our organization. So there's some really exciting tech and capabilities here, but what is even more exciting is the new ways of working, which it enables. So the first thing we do is get people, our analysts to store their code on GitHub, which is very familiar to software engineers, but is a little bit new for analysts we found. And this is really useful because team members can con concurrently work on, on the same files. Every save is versioned, it's all organized and auditable. Their code is shared throughout the analyst community so they can share best practices. Each uh, pull request they make is reviewed by their peers and they can write unit tests to increase the quality. The next thing which is really exciting is reproducibility. That's the idea that if you save the, the version of the code as it was and the version of data as it was when you ran your algorithm, you can reproduce it at a later point, which is really, really important when you've got a justice minister changing the justice system on the basis of some of these results. And the last thing is automatability. These data pipelines from the source all the way for extraction transformation to the outputs can be automated, which leaves time for analysts to talk about and analyze and think about why the numbers are going up and down rather than all those manual stages. So just to hammer home the uh, benefits of the analytical platform, we're getting better access to the data because it's all in one system in one place. We've got higher quality methods, all that reproducibility, the peer reviews, the unit testing. They have better capability, this galaxy of open source libraries and powerful cloud services. They've got end-to-end -end automation so the data products are always up to date and they can deliver interactive visualizations to communicate data um, really throughout the organization. And I'll just finish by talking about I have to talk about 30 seconds, I uh, mentioned an app we're running on it, which demonstrates what we can do. Oh, that's exciting. I can't see it. Um, uh, it's a safety diagnostic tool which displays data about violence in prisons. Uh, it's a prototype we're currently using uh, by safety teams in prisons to get a clear picture of where the issues are and help them make decisions to do interventions to reduce violence. 
The data comes from lots of different prison systems, ex extracted and processed automatically and feeds into this web app on the platform and access is provided securely to authorized staff. This protects, protects the staff and prisoners and improves, improves prisoner life outcomes. And I think the lesson is that once you have the data infrastructure set up, delivering data insights like this to anywhere in the organization is not a lot of extra work. And this is just one of the many things we've achieved with good data infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was really interesting and uh, extra points for the hammer pun at the end as well. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, if you would like to put your questions to David through me, um, please do use the Q&A tool. Uh, we've got eight minutes for the final set of questions and we've already got a really good one from Craig Morris. So I'm gonna start with that. Um, he says, from the network diagrams, it seems that the systems are very specific output orientated. How much flexibility do you have in the system to personalize output for analytics and more pertinently for data sharing as well. To personalize it, well we know the user who's logged into the app, so like any app you can change what you display depending on who that is and I guess an example is in that safety diagnostic tool. Uh, we, we only let people see the prisoners in their own prison, we can't see uh, prisoners in another prison, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be right, so that, that is personalized to an extent. What was the second part of that, Gavin? Uh, so the second part of that was um, for data sharing as well. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is all really, really flexible. You, 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 you can write a Python program, to, you, you can get it to do what you want. Uh, I mean, I, I'd emphasize that, that some of the, the, these things are prototypes and they're, they're, they're thrown together very quickly, uh, it, like visually to make these, these apps. There's a lot of care goes into the data behind them, but but the the, the front end is, is is essentially a prototype. Uh, and when these go into production, uh, they're rolled out to to on a larger scale, then we get a proper digital team to do a better job with proper user research and design, for example. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Dan Klein who says, awesome data infrastructure. Um, the ONS Data Science Campus are using Jupyter Notebooks. Have you considered that to help those people who might be more used to Excel to feel more comfortable in accessing and using the new world? Yeah, well, we're really pleased that the platform is pretty uh, flexible. Uh, we, we can run any container. So uh, we run Jupyter Notebooks for the people who want to use them. Uh, the majority of our, our analysts are into R and they and they you, you try and take R Studio away from them over their dead bodies. Um, but we, we can run other things and, and things like VS Code. There are also uh, so many people are asking for uh, and there are other notebook software. And, and as I mean, it's a really fast changing uh, world and, and we're, we're prepared for the, for the new things coming along. So it, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Um, so we've got another question from Mary Susan. She asks, are any specific products being used for data cleansing? And at what point is the quality compliance enforced? No, for, for data cleansing, oh, excuse me. It's okay, take a moment. Uh, we, we, we don't, we, we tend to use open source products, open source uh, utilities. And so I'm not familiar with exactly what is being used for data cleansing, but I imagine there's, a, as, a, as I say, a galaxy of options in, in the community used by all the top Silicon Valley companies and the, and the, and the, and the major uh, data scientists in, 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 the, in the main community. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question now from Ash Tanky, who says, great talk, David. Um, they've, they've just recently started working within local government as a data scientist, but not much, but um, much of the infrastructure is not in place. And most of their concerns have been persuading the team to trust cloud platforms and sharing code on GitHub. So especially given what, what you were saying during your presentation, what advice do you have in starting best practices around that? It, it, it is a real challenge getting the security right and uh, assuring your service for the security perspective. This is this is the biggest thing we hear around government in in doing similar things. Uh, with uh, with using GitHub, I I think the the concern is what well, one of the key concerns is is using public repositories, and GDS have forged a way with making sure that when people do development, they use public repositories, and this is a very very good reason. It's more difficult in the analyst community because they are not specialists at programming in the way that developers are usually built up a few years. Uh, they are they have to be good at stats and they have to be good at lots of other things as well. Uh, so it's not their primary thing. 
and so the, there, there is a higher risk that they might uh, upload a bit of data into their repository and it goes public straight away and, and so that that can be an issue so we're a little bit uh cagey about making uh repositories public until people have earned their stripes uh and then the general security so the the, the the path we have forged is to get really really good technical people who uh, have the trust of the, the people who have to ensure assurance for these platforms who can do a really good job of it and we're following the ncsc security principles for the cloud which uh which are excellent and show you can get much better security in the cloud than you might imagine from a, a, a data center for the same sort of cost. Great, thank you. So Simon S asks, what were the steps to ensure information assurance and in bringing multiple data sources of this type of data together? It's a good question. Uh, so we wouldn't want to have the entire government's data in one place uh, on, the, on the platform we've designed. But as I say, the, the, the cloud has lots and lots of ways to make things more secure than you might do in a data center. And so uh, we have we have taken the appropriate steps to to be super secure for the Ministry of Justice's data. Great, thank you. Um, so Selena says that the sort of prison data on stopping crime sounds really interesting. Does that work by guards putting incidents into an app? I don't know how, how much more you can talk to us about that yeah so i i mean I'm, I'm not completely familiar how it works but incidents are logged in the prison computer system and uh so things like assaults and self-harm uh, uh they're all they're all listed as as uh, in the database and so it uh, but you, you can expose this information to the people who are interested in the safety aspect to give them a really clear view of what's going on in the prison Great. Um, so Sam Smith's asked a question that's something we find quite a lot across government, which is departments perhaps not really fully understanding the extent of the data that they have. So he says when he asked 18 months ago, um, MOJ was one of those departments that didn't know what data it had or who was responsible for it. And um, he's not sure whether this is in your remit, but do you know how bringing a list of that together is going or how you might approach such a thing? Well, I think it's important not just for the people outside of government, uh, but also people in departments who understand what data they have. And there tends to be a little bit of a, a, a sneaker net of knowledge about where things are. So there are analyst teams for every part of what we do, and you ask them what data we have, and they're very familiar. Uh, turning that into a, a, a big list, uh, which which people on high can have a kind of asset register, is a much harder proposition, and, and it's even harder to keep it up to date. Um, but you know, big organisations really sh should should have this. I, I firmly believe, and it's, it's one of our aims to 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 get that list, uh, not least for uh, for GDPR reasons. And uh, one of the great things about bringing the data together in our platform is that we have a list of buckets. Uh, you know, people request data, and they're all going to find it in this one place. And so we can we can, for example, do audits on each of them to make sure they've got DPIAs and all, and all the all the the right documentation and assurance. Great, and I'm going to squeeze in a very, very quick final question. Um, so David Durant notes on Twitter, he says it's lovely to hear about um, your platform. He knows that DWP has got one, HMRC has got one as well, and obviously there are some risks about duplication of effort and money across government. So just wondering as a sort of final thought, how are you working with other departments and other organisations, making sure that the set, that lessons learned across government um, and sort of interaction you have with others on analytical platforms? So we regularly talk to a lot of the departments about what they've got and we hear a lot of the frustrations and of course we have frustrations as well uh, but i'm i'm confident that we've got one of the better ones um and and people uh, uh I, there's also it's also worth saying that different organizations do need to do them differently we have grown ours organically designing it for the needs of, of the sort of data we have and i think People, you know, uh, have very different data challenges in different departments in the way it's it's collected and organised. And some departments have beautifully linked up data, you know, just just by the way it happens. And some people have very very scattered around data uh, and have really different challenges. So I think I think uh, it's also worth saying that this is still a quite a new area. Uh, so for example, people like uh, the, the cloud services companies are getting in on the act on this as well and starting to get more and more useful. Uh, products in this area. Uh, so I can see us all uh, ending up using those in a couple of years when they're mature and do what, what we want. 
Uh, but in the meantime, we're all we're all uh, trying to do something that that suits what we've got at the moment. David, that was really interesting. Thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, so I'm now the only thing uh, between all of you and virtual drinks. I'll keep this short. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen. So if you would like to join us for virtual drinks, you can see how to join us. Um, the link is bit.ly slash db14 drinks. It's case sensitive, capital D, capital B. And the password is ifgdb14. Um, I'll be starting that up in a few minutes. So do join us there. Be great to see you. Um, and yes, what a wonderful data bytes it's been. Definitely one of my favourites, actually, the 14 we've done. I think uh, fittingly on Bonfire Night, uh, generating more light than heat. Um, a few things to tell you about coming up at the Institute um, over the next few weeks. Um, lots of events. We've got one tomorrow on science advice uh, and how government uses that. So if you enjoyed tonight, you may well enjoy that. And I'm sure lots of you um, have been involved in various digital and data initiatives in government. One of the sort of key politicians driving that under the coalition was Francis Maud. He'll be in conversation with our director, Bronwyn Maddox, um, as well over the next few weeks. So do go to the Institute for Government website and take a look at that. Um, all that remains for me to say, apart from hopefully you'll be able to join us on the 2nd of December, Wednesday the 2nd of December at 6pm for the next Data Bytes. Um, two very big thank yous. First of all to all of you for joining us this evening, some fantastic questions that I was able to put to our speakers, so I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And finally, join me in a virtual round of applause for our four fantastic speakers this evening. Huge amount of ground covered, wonderful variety in what they were talking about, um, and I hope you learned as much as I did. So thank you very much. <laughs>